Good evening. You're watching the news at 7:30 on ATV. I'm Raymond Yang, and I'm Marcus Chi. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Hong Kong swelters on hottest day on record. Fujian province braces for Typhoon Sodalo after leaving a trail of destruction in Taiwan. And more blood tests arranged due to continuing water contamination scandal. Hong Kong has experienced its hottest day on record, despite today being the start of the autumn season. The mercury hit 36.2 degrees Celsius at the observatory this afternoon, with temperatures in some areas going up as high as 37.8 degrees. According to the lunar calendar, today marks the beginning of the autumn season, but real-life conditions gave a completely different impression. The observatory announced it locked a temperature of 36.2 degrees at its headquarters this afternoon, the hottest day ever on record since readings were taken in the city in 1885. It eclipsed the previous high of 36.1 degrees set in 1900 and 1990. Under the influence of outer subsiding air of Typhoon Sodalo, the scorching heat affected most of the territory, with Shengshui recording 37.8 degrees. The highest recorded in the city. This pregnant mom said she had to keep drinking water to prevent getting a heat stroke. While this man said he felt the street was burning. But people on the streets not only had to deal with sweltering conditions, as the strong sunshine and light wind triggered photochemical smog reactions, meaning pollutants are trapped in the area and cannot be dispersed. Thirteen of the city's 15 air monitoring stations returned very high indexes. Meaning prolonged outdoor activities could be hazardous to health. The Home Affairs Department announced 15 temporary shelters will open from 10:30 p.m. tonight. Relief from the heat spell could arrive as soon as Monday, with showers and thunderstorms expected. Fujian Province is bracing for Typhoon Sodalo, which is expected to make landfall later this evening. Sodalo earlier battered Taiwan, killing eight people and injuring 64 others. People in Taiwan are slowly picking up the pieces after Typhoon Sodalo, packing winds of up to 200 kilometers per hour, made landfall earlier this morning on the east coast counties of Yilan and Hualien. The typhoon killed several people, including a mother and a child who were swept to sea, and a fireman who was helping remove a fallen tree. The death toll is expected to rise as more people are reported to be missing. Nearly 10,000 people had to be evacuated to safer areas, and reports say some two million people are without power. Businesses and schools were shut for the day, while numerous trains and flights were cancelled. Here in Hong Kong, nearly 60 flights to and from Taiwan have been delayed, while around 30 have been cancelled. In the meantime, Sodor Law is headed for Fujian Province. Hundreds of thousands of people have been evacuated to safer areas, while tens of thousands of ships return to port. Many trains and flights to the capital city of Fuzhou have been cancelled. Weather forecasters say Sodalo will bring heavy rains to Fujian, Jiangxi, Jiangxi, and Guangdong in the coming four to five days. The health department says it has arranged for some 2,500 people to have their blood tested for excessive lead. This comes as a construction company orders the removal of all water pipes installed at a public housing estate in light of a lead-tainted water scandal. Vicky Wen reports. It's emerged that construction workers at a public housing estate on Anderson Road in Kun Tong are removing all the water pipes that have been installed there. According to the housing authority, it is a decision made by the contractor of the project. In light of the recent lead in the water scandal, the water supplies department updated the guidelines last month. It said contractors have to ensure the soldering materials used for the water supply systems in the buildings that are completed after the 31st of July of this year should not contain lead. In a related development, Under Secretary for Food and Health Sophia Chen said the Department of Health had received around 4,000 inquiries and arranged blood tests for 2,500 people. She said the authorities are still waiting for the mobile blood testing equipment, which would help alleviate the burden of government labs. Speaking on a radio show this morning, Lechco Housing Panels Chairwoman Alice Mack criticized Chief Secretary Carrie Lam for failing to resolve the tainted water scandal. She said the government should have done remedial works as soon as it was discovered that some housing estates had lead in their drinking water. 
Meg, who is also a unionist legislator, said the party will discuss whether to invoke electrical special powers to probe into the scandal when the council resumes in October. But she said finding out the source of contamination is more pressing than summoning frontline staff to Lechko during the summer break, as suggested by the Civic Party. We think that we need to um, expand the scale of the blood tests of the residents. Uh, this is a confidence problem. So the government must do more than enough to regain and uh, to recover the confidence of the residents and Hong Kong Kong people. Meanwhile, convener of Alliance of Tainted Water Victims and Democratic Party Vice Chairman Andrew Wen has described the lead contamination scare as a community disaster. Wen slammed the government for acting too slow to allay people's fears and not disclosing the investigation results. I think uh, if the government wants to uh, get back the confidence of the public, uh, the transparency of the uh, progress and uh, the speed should be uh, uh, catch up. Wen said the government should lay out a schedule to deal with the pipe replacements and compensation requests. Vicky Wen, ATV News. Customs officers have arrested a truck driver and seized cigarettes worth over $1 million. Officers say the cigarettes were concealed in six fake baking ovens, the third such case this year of smugglers using stoves, Vicky Wen reports. Customs officers said they seized 700,000 cigarettes in six fake baking ovens from a truck at the Lok Macho control point. Lok Macho divisional commander Chu Puiki said the truck's manifest claimed the vehicle was carrying baking ovens and plastic bags. When customs staff demanded to do a spot check on the vehicle, the truck driver appeared to be overenthusiastic and directed them to examine the rear park of the truck. The friendly attitude of the driver raised customs officers' suspicions, and they decided to scan the whole truck instead and discovered the hidden cigarettes. Ju added that the fake bacon ovens had rough surfaces, and a button on one of the ovens had become loose during the inspection. The batch of cigarettes were worth around $1.8 million. The 42-year-old male driver was arrested at the scene. Customs officers said it is the third case this year that smugglers have turned to use stoves to hide the contraband cigarettes. Vicky Wen, ATV News. Overseas, human rights groups in Bangladesh have called for a swift and thorough investigation into the killing of another blogger. It's the fourth such killing of an online critic of religious extremism in six months. Hamina Singh reports. Neil O'Neill is the latest blogger to be murdered in Bangladesh after he was hacked to death in his flat in the capital Dhaka by a group of men armed with machetes. Real name Neil O'Neill Chatterjee, the 40-year-old was a voice for women's rights, indigenous people's rights and other social justice causes. He also advocated for secularism and was a critic of religious extremism that led to bombings in mosques. Ironically, he had been demanding justice for three other bloggers who were killed in the past six months for being vocal critics of religious extremism. Human rights groups are calling for a swift and thorough investigation. Here, we are here for justice of blogger uh, Nilo and Neil, and you know, uh, here uh, we have lost already lost four bloggers, and we, have, uh, we demand justice for uh, the killing of bloggers. Amnesty International also urged Bangladesh to send a strong message that killings aimed at silencing dissenting voices were despicable and would not be tolerated. Hardline Islamist groups seeking to make Bangladesh a Sharia-based state have been targeting secularist writers in recent years. Harminder Singh, ATV News. A jury in the U.S. state of Colorado has sentenced movie massacre gunman James Holmes to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But first, in our roundup of foreign news, there have been more attacks in Afghanistan, including a suicide bombing that killed at least 27 people. Scott Murphy has the details. A suicide bomber wearing an officer's uniform placed himself amongst a group of young cadets as they were returning to a Kabul police academy and detonated his explosives, killing over 20 people and wounding at least 20 more. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack. Later, overnight, another car bomb was detonated at a NATO Special Forces base, which was followed by a gun battle that left one force member and two insurgents dead. It was late in the night when the fighting started between insurgents and security forces, this man said. It lasted for hours in the area. It was terrible. 
Afghan President Mohammad Ashraf Ghani visited injured victims of the first bombing, which had killed 15 and flattened a city block. In total, the three blasts left 36 dead and hundreds wounded in the first major attacks since Mullah Akhtar Mansour was named the new Taliban chief, replacing the late Mullah Mohammed Omar. We, the jury, find the defendant. James Holmes, the man who killed 12 people and wounded 70 others when he went on a shooting spree in a Colorado theater three years ago, has been sentenced to life in prison. The 27-year-old escaped the death penalty after the nine jurors failed to reach a unanimous verdict. One juror opposed it. The person was solidly and definitively in the position where they were going to do a life sentence and there was no persuading. With prosecutors saying during the trial that Holmes intended to kill all 400 moviegoers, the grandparents of one victim expressed the thoughts of many observers about the verdict. Unfortunately, at least one juror who did not vote for the death penalty is going to give Colorado a very ugly face. When you look at, you know, what's happened in light of this, that's not justice. Holmes will serve a mandatory life sentence with no possibility of parole. A UK-based human rights group says over 230 people have been either kidnapped or detained in a Syrian village taken over by ISIS militants. 45 women, 19 children, and dozens of Christian families are said to be part of the group who were captured when ISIS militants took over the village of Kariatang, as seen here in footage believed to be filmed this week and released online. 1,400 other families are believed to have fled the area and have taken shelter elsewhere. And in Iraq, the country's defense minister says that ISIS executed over 2,000 Iraqis, including journalists and police, in the northern city of Nineveh. Witnesses say the executions had taken place over the past six months. Scott Murphy, ATV News. And here's the story for all space buffs. Researchers in Austria are carrying out experiments as part of a simulated mission to Mars. At 3,000 meters above sea level, the Connertal Glacier Valley offers what experts describe as ideal conditions for replicating the red planet. The researchers, wearing spacesuits weighing up to 50 kilos, bought the rocks of the Austrian Alps as they began their experiments as part of a simulated mission to Mars. One of the researchers said he was excited about the simulation exercise. Well, from a personal point of view, my main goal is to feel the closest as possible as a real astronaut will feel in the future, in Mars or in other bodies. And for the mission perspective, is uh, fulfill as many objectives and experiments as possible. So I will try my best. The researchers face tough conditions. They are weighed down by cumbersome spacesuits and can only communicate via radio and must wait 20 minutes before their mission control in Innsbruck can respond to them. The experiments are aimed at investigating the limitations astronauts might find in the field of engineering and planetary surface operations, for instance. It is estimated that it will take another 20 to 30 years before astronauts can be sent to Mars.